Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on this beautiful, sunny February day on, in Southwest London. Um, you're joining us for introducing Rubric, a new approach to data protection. Uh, so I'm James, I'm here from Data Barracks. And we've been joined by our visiting guest expert, which is Ed Morgan from the Office of the CTO at Rubric. Uh, I'll let him give himself a proper introduction in just a second. Um, and I'm gonna carry out all of the bits of housekeeping. Um, so just a really quick intro from us. So hopefully you know um, what we're all about. We're a, a business continuity disaster recovery provider, uh, and we provide a number of different technologies. Um, and I've had our eye on Rubric for a, a little while, ever since it was uh, kind of initially launched as a really exciting piece of tech. Um, and officially, we, we um, started providing Rubric um, at the end of last year. So this is our, our first um, webinar with our, our kind of visiting expert um, to give you a, an idea of, of kind of what goes on there behind the scenes for the tech. Um, so, um, the shape for the day, I'll just get you onto the next slide. So we're, if you've been on any of our webinars before, um, same format as usual. So we're, we're scheduled for 30 minutes today and we'll be really um, diligent to be tight to that to make sure you can get off, um, off, off afterwards. Uh, any questions you have, type them in on the right hand side. We, uh, we promise we will make sure we answer anything that's typed in. Uh, if we can do it today, we will do. Um, if there's too many or anything that we, we kind of can't answer properly on the, on the session, we'll make sure we get back to you individually. Um, and then the first question as always will be, uh, is this being recorded and can I get access to the slides? Uh, it's a yes to both of those. So either later this afternoon or, or first thing tomorrow, we'll, get, we'll make sure all of that's um, so, uh, all, all, all kind of sent out to everyone who's, uh, who's on the session today. Uh, so, the last thing before I pass over to Ed, I want to do is just uh, give a quick plug to our business continuity podcast, which is uh, the BCP cast. Um, so you may have heard me uh, mention, mention about this before. Um, it's, it's something we set up to talk about beyond technology. So this is going to be quite a, a techie deep dive today. But obviously, IT resilience is one small part of an overall business continuity uh, plan. And that's what we try to do with the BCP cast. So we go out to uh, business continuity professionals at some of the largest uh, companies in the world, people who are, are really, really good at what they do um, and get them to, to put into kind of simple language, some, some simple takeaways, things that we can all apply in our businesses. Uh, I think an awful lot of folks have been um, soured on the idea of business continuity planning by quite dull or dry um, consultants and practitioners. Um, and it, you, it couldn't be further from the truth when you talk to, to the, these people. They're, they're deeply practical, they're really reasonable, and everything they do is about applied common sense. Um, so the first episode of season three uh, will be launched later this week. Um, so you can uh, sign up and subscribe at iTunes or, or Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher if you're on Android, uh, or you can actually listen to them directly from the website, bcpcast.com. This year we went to, to BCI World and we spoke to all of the experts there. So we've got cyber experts, uh, supply chain experts, and folks from uh, MasterCard and Google. I promise it's genuinely worth a, worth a listen. Um, and with that, I will hand over uh, and pass you over to, to Ed from Rubik. Thanks for joining us, Ed. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, so hi guys. Um, just do a quick introduction about myself. Um, my name is Ed Morgan. Uh, I have been at Rubrik about two years now. Um, I was one of the first SEs in EMEA. And uh, recently I moved into the office of the CTO, which um, allows me to focus on some of the kind of more interesting stuff we do around uh, cloud integrations and APIs and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so just going to do a very quick introduction or as to how we've come about as a company and how we've evolved over the past kind of three to four years we've been shipping product and then i'll go into a kind of high level overview of um our approach to data protection and and how we kind of feel with with we're taking a bit of a revolutionary take on on kind of what is traditionally a quite stale um part of it so any questions you've got, throw them into the chat box. As we said, we'll we'll get to those as we get to the end. I'm going to try and rattle through the slides in the next sort of 15 or so minutes. We've got so we've got a good good five or ten minutes left for Q and A. So how have we evolved in the past kind of three years since we started shipping products? So V1 launched mid 2015, and effectively all we were doing was we were backing up 
uh, virtual machines, VMware VMs, and we were archiving those out to Amazon S3. We were doing that in a very, very nice fashion, API first, you know, very performance, but effectively it was a very small segment of the market we could we could cover off. From there, we've had two to three major releases every year, covering off, you know, everything from from DR to object storage coverage, physical VMs, uh, v, sorry, physical uh, machines, uh, virtualized rubric instances for your remote offices. Um, you know, application portability with things like Cloud On, and um, you know, as of 2018, we cover off pretty much every enterprise workload uh, and pretty much every major cloud provider as well. Um, and we can do some really nice stuff with that data once we get it. So clearly, I work for Rubric. I'm also going to stand here and tell you how awesome we are. Um, but it's nice to see that we have some kind of constant recognition from not just our partner. Um, partner community who we work with, but also the kind of uh, analysts and industry press as well. You can see that we've got Garner Call Vendor, we hit the magic quadrant, uh, we were the fastest company ever to hit the magic quadrant, we did it in three years. Um, you know, we, we've got a whole bunch of best of VM world awards, all that kind of good stuff. So it's nice to nice to have some validation outside of somebody who works for, the, works for a company to, to, to kind of validate that we're also doing some good stuff. Uh, as I mentioned, we've won Best of Show in VMworld two years in a row at VMworld US and VMworld Europe. Uh, we've won the Gold Award for Data Protection three years in a row, and this year we also won the Gold Award for Security, which is pretty interesting considering we don't, uh, we, we're not a security company by kind of a, by design almost. So yeah, it's really nice. We're really proud of this. Uh, you know, we work very closely with VMware clearly, so um, yeah, it's really nice to get that validation from them as well. From an investment perspective, we've just done our Series E rounds. We've raised 553 million against the 3.3 billion dollar valuation. Um, that's clearly quite a lot of cash, so we're not going anywhere. Um, and you can see that our, our investment rounds have been led by some some pretty big names within Silicon Valley. Um, four of which are very very experienced within the um, the data protection um, uh, industry. So it's really nice to see them coughing up their own cash to invest in a company that they believe can really change the way people are managing their data. And clearly John Chambers is, is John Chambers and it's amazing to have him on our board and investing his own cash on, you know, and helping us grow. So yeah, really, really, really strong position financially, which is always, always nice to be, to be in. So uh, let's just move quickly on to, I guess, the technology and our approach to data protection. So, not a lot has changed in the way people manage their data in, in the last 20, 25 years, 30 years almost, right? You know, this, this kind of traditional three-tier kind of monolithic architecture was designed for a very specific point in time. And 90% of people I go and talk to, this is what their data protection or data management estate looks like. You've got a whole plethora of infrastructure running software, maybe some proxies, another bunch of stuff running replications, some servers, some SQL servers maybe holding your catalog databases, a couple of those if you need resiliency, another database for your DGP, uh, your DGP and metadata store, um, a whole bunch of disk storage for um, your first or second point of restore, and then you probably chuck it to tape and a man from Iron Mountain comes along and puts it in a van and drives it off somewhere safe or maybe to your secondary office location or something. Very, very complex infrastructure stack, no unified API endpoints, lots of different management planes typically, you know, and, and while this um, architecture has been workable for a long time, um, over the period of those last 30 years, we've seen a whole bunch of innovation around, you know, the virtualization revolution has been and gone. You know, we're talking about hyperconvergence, API-led infrastructure, cloud, automation, and modern day security threats such as ransomware and all these sorts of things. Now, retrofitting a 30 year old architecture into you know, the cloud uh, as a place or, or as a consumption model is very, very difficult. And also um, providing the ability to automate and allow self-service and restores and stuff is typically very difficult. So if you're running this kind of estate, it's really, really heavy to kind of offer these things to your business units or to your customers. So Rubrik, or our founders particularly, took a look at this uh, and decided to kind of apply some of these modern 
design principles to data management. And they've, they've designed this uh, software fabric that can run on either commodity hardware or, um, you know, as I said, virtualized editions for your remote data center or in cloud native versions that can run in any public cloud platform with a single unified code base across all of those uh, installations. And that is completely 100% uh, uh, driven by REST API and also designed from a security perspective for your modern day threats such as ransomware and all that kind of good stuff or bad stuff. So how does it work? Let me just build this out. So super simple to set up um, because we have a very, uh, a very, a very, a very simple scale out uh, deployment methodology and from a build um, perspective, it, it, it just requires some IP addresses effectively. The traditional 30 day sales and all that kind of good stuff go away. And more importantly, once it's in place, it's super simple to manage. Everything is driven by um, by policies that we call SLA domains, where effectively you just define your RTOs and your RPOs and how long you want to keep that data for. And then the system decides how it's going to meet those RTOs and RPOs effectively. It's fully declarative. Um, so typically management savings go down from hours a day to minutes a day. As I said, we cover off pretty much all enterprise applications, be that things that you wouldn't necessarily expect, such as AIX, Solaris, um, to your more modern day um, NoSQL uh, things such as Cassandra and MongoDB, or your cloud um, SaaS workloads such as Office 365. It's pretty wide coverage across, across that um, enterprise application base. And our recovery times are typically super fast because we call it instant recovery. It's not quite instant. Um, but what we can do is we can expose the rubric cluster as a tier of, tier of storage back to your virtual estate or back to your application such, such as SQL or Oracle. And we can reconstruct a point in time snapshot of that data set from, you know, it could be two days ago. It could be, could be a week ago, you know, whenever you want to do it and present that directly back into your estate to allow you to get back online in seconds as opposed to you know minutes or maybe hours with a traditional um a, a traditional data protection estate um we're built for the cloud um what that means is we have very tight integrations into uh the public cloud providers but we also are architected in a in a fashion that allows you to apply kind of cloud methodologies to your on-premises uh, architectures as well so we can deliver things like self-service scale out charge back all of that kind of all that kind of good stuff um, so yeah we can push push all of our data sets natively to to the public cloud uh, we integrate natively into AWS uh, s3 glacier as your blob uh, you know GCP cold line all that kind of good stuff um, we have a search capability within within the platform we call it a google like search i think that's because a lot of our engineers come from google um, but you can search for a file that, that may have been under management five years ago and it could have been pushed to public cloud or tape or wherever and we can still search for that file across your entire data set in seconds and then pull that individual file back for you uh, without any requirement for compute sitting in the public cloud or or you know some somewhere else we can drive that all natively from within the rubric platform really really fast and really really easy and built for security. So those modern day security threats I was talking about, like ransomware, um, we've we've really been designed in a fashion that allows us to protect very well against that. So our file system is immutable by design. So after we've committed a data set to the rubric platform, um, the file system effectively is append only. So there's no way that can be overwritten by, you know, your classic WannaCry or something like that. Everything's encrypted end to end. Um, be it in flight, be it on the rubric cluster, or be it wherever you decide to tear that data off to. And we have um, a platform called Polaris, which does metadata analysis of your data sets and leverages. Um, I'm not going to say AI, but it, it definitely uses machine learning under the hood to recognize anomalies on your data set that may have been caused by a huge spike in change rates or a mass deletion of files. Uh, and that can then proactively alert you about that and allow you to recover from that, um, be it data breach or be it uh, corruption in, again, seconds, as opposed to perhaps you not knowing about this for, for 
you know, a few days when somebody decides to log onto a NAS and you've decided that your data's gone. So really, really quick recovery. And, you know, we're not trying to, rec um, trying to replace your, your, your security, um, your security vendors, but because we know all of this data about your data set, this is a nice value add we can offer as, um, as, a, as an additional benefit on top of maybe your Palo Alto or whatever you're using for threat detection at this point. So here's the multi-cloud dream that, you know, everyone's talking about, um, not many people are at, but what, what we're trying to get out of here is we can manage your data set regardless of where it lives uh, and offer portability of that data between on-premises applications, public cloud, um, you know, wherever it resides, as I said, it's a single unified code base, wherever it may be. Um, and, you know, we can we can take a VM that's running on premises, instantiate that into AWS or Azure, if you want to do things like DR into the cloud or cloud bursting and all that kind of good stuff. The marketing folks will tell you that we're trying to uh, liberate your applications and your data from the underlying infrastructure. Um, they'll love it that I've said that. <laughs> so, the things that I get really excited about Rubrik, um, absolutely everything we do is exposed via REST API. Um, a lot of people will say that, um, but really with us, we 100% mean it. We are our management plane just calls our REST API, so we rely upon it just as much as our, as our customers do. And this is important for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, you will never have to log into the GUI if you choose not to. Um, so we can orchestrate all of the management functionality with things like ServiceNow. You know, if you realize effectively anything that you, you want to use from an ITSM or ITOM perspective uh, to, to drive your data management estate or whatever you're doing for config or ops management. This is also very good from a service provider perspective because it allows uh, our partners like Data Barracks to, to build very rich services around not just you know, backup as a service or DR as a service, they can start offering things like, you know, database as a service, maybe or copy data management as a service, and then they can deliver that that offering to you guys as customers uh, in a really easy to integrate fashion. Again, it could be via service now or whatever you choose to use, or maybe a custom built uh, management plan if that's, if that's something you want to do. So what's good about REST APIs? Super powerful. Um, you know, as I said, we've got 100% API coverage and you can control absolutely everything we do via REST and completely extensible. So, you know, if you maybe want to do a bulk restore of stuff or a bulk, bulk search across a whole different load of data sets, that can absolutely be queried in, in, you know, a couple of lines of code. Really, really easy to, uh, to learn how to consume our API. We leverage something called the Open API standard. Um, it was formerly known as Swagger, um, but I think the guys who, or the steering council, um, decided they might need a slightly more professional um, name because it's being used by people like Facebook, and you know, it's kind of the de facto standard now. So all of the documentation is running all of the cluster itself, and that includes a playground that again allows uh, you as customers or our partners to to test out. Uh, and learn how to integrate the APIs very, very easily. And it's 100% up to date as soon as we update the platform documentation updates as well. And again, as I said, li live access to the API through the industry standards. Um, so anyone or anyone who's doing anything with um, automation and orchestration knows how to how to leverage this. And it's, it's so easy, even I can learn how to automate stuff leveraging it, which is always a bonus. And as I said, super easy to integrate stuff. If you go to our GitHub, um, which is github.com slash rubric inc, you will see we have a whole bunch of pre-built stuff, be that PowerShell, be it vRealize, uh, the ServiceNow stuff up there, Splunk modules, uh, you know, all of, the, all of the big things, Chef, Puppet, Ansible. It, it's all up there and all open sourced. Uh, and we, we truly encourage um, not just partners, but anyone who wishes to get involved in in helping to helping to build out or, or offer a community around those integrations, we we 100% encourage that. So take a look at the GitHub site and also go to build.rubric.com to to get some more information around that stuff. And finally, I touched briefly on it earlier. Um, we I also might say just about six months ago, we released a platform called Polaris, which is a software as a service offering, um, uh, which allows 
applications to be built on top of your global rubric infrastructure as opposed to um, individual rubric instances. So this is running um, as a service, as I said, and it pulls metadata effectively from all of your rubric instances globally and leverages the compute in the public cloud to do some good stuff around that bit. Um, you know, I talked about the ransomware recovery, the, the compute in the public cloud allows us to uh, to crunch that data a lot quicker than if we were using the the on the on premises uh, bricks, but it also allows us to do some good stuff around searching within those data sets, be it for things like PII or you know um, GDPR type um, type data searches and data classification. So really really powerful, and that is also all exposed via Northbound API as well. So we have um, partners like Palo Alto and people like that building their own integrations into Polaris. So and just another way that we allow customers and partners to get some value out of that data as opposed to putting it on a tape and sticking it in a, in a cupboard somewhere, you know, for seven years. So what sort of benefits does this allow your business to have? Instant recovery obviously allows you to, to shorten your RTOs considerably um, and the fact that we can spin up those point in time data sets, be they from a day ago or be they from a month ago or th three months ago, again, really powerful from a testing dev perspective. Maybe you want to take last night's data set from your production SQL, SQL estate and spin that up into test and dev. Absolutely no worries. Can be done instantly and fully orchestrated via API. So maybe you want to tie it into your Jenkins workflows or whatever you're doing for CI CD. You know, real time savings there because it can all be orchestrated. And again, we allow people to use the cloud, not just for archival, um, but, you know, we've got customers who've closed down their secondary data center and are just using Azure for Azure or AWS for DR. And, you know, we can orchestrate that 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 failover directly from the rubric console. Uh, the radar story, again, as I talked about ransomware, really, really powerful. Um, and again, a nice value add we do. And if you're not automating and orchestrating stuff now you probably will be in the future because that's the way the industry is going so having a platform that allows you to, to to fully orchestrate that that data protection part of your business again really 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 powerful and again just a few few public customers we've got here who um who are funnily enough getting those exact same benefits um that i've just talked about so uh, AMG Patronus, that's a really good one. Um, not just because I like Formula One, but they've they've orchestrated pretty much all of their all of their um, their recovery of the data. So this is protecting all the race data, and it's really allowed them to to crunch those that data sets quicker. And I'm not going to say allowed them to be more successful within the F1, but I think it has. <clears throat> and you know, uh, people like Frostbank, uh, you know, were really concerned about ransomware, and we're giving them some um, some nice nice data sets with that and some good savings there for UC San Diego. Seems to be some duplicate size there, but uh, no worries. So yeah, just talking about um, uh, radar, this is our ransomware recovery. So as I said, we can detect that some data sets have changed, uh, leveraging machine learning. We can show you what has changed within which, which backup or which data set. And you know, with one click, you can restore directly back into in place, or you can throw it back into another location for quarantine, and you can an anal analyze what's uh, what's potentially inf infected your data. And again, this was a big one for for ASL. Um, they they really love this, uh, and they're a big public reference for us now. So yeah, in summary, I think I'm doing okay for time as well. Amazingly, um, so in summary. Built for automation and hybrid cloud, um, not just the place, but the consumption model. It's really, really difficult to to drive to a more modern business model if you if you can't automate and you don't expose stuff via API. This is this is a really important thing for us. And again, as I said, security against modern security threats. It's it, it's great being able to protect data, but if people can still corrupt that, uh, you know, your 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 backups should be your last good copy of your data and because we are uh, append only you can you can be guaranteed that you can't be compromised by things like ransomware and again we allow you the, the ability to recover very very fast from that so i think it's uh 
I think it's pretty much time for questions. Thanks very much for your time. So let's see what we've got. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And so thanks so much for that. Now, the first thing before we jump into the questions uh, that I'm just going to mention is uh, obviously super, super detailed. Thanks, Ed. That was really good. We've got obviously we've, we've asked Ed to talk through a really, really complex product set and load of features in, in 20 minutes. So we've, we, this is a, a kind of a whistle stop tour of, of, of everything. I think you can see how much um, goes on behind this. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is, is perhaps where you can hear a bit more. Now it's it's end of Feb now, and we're just about to get into that busy season of, of lots of different uh, tech events. But in particular, um, both both Rubrik and Databricks, we're both going to be at Cloud Expo. Uh, so Cloud Expo Europe, uh, I think it's the 11th and 12th of, of March. It's a couple of weeks time uh, in, in London at the Excel. Uh, if you're there, come and see us both. We can obviously go into this in a, in a lot more detail, um, run you through, uh, yeah, through all, all of these use cases far more. Um, and the first question I've got now, I've got a couple of these I think perhaps you've sort of touched upon, but maybe not answered kind of explicitly through. Um, so we'll, we'll run through these and you can kind of uh, fill them all in. So the first one is, uh, does Rubrik support physical machines? If not, will it? Yep. So uh, we do completely support physical workloads. Um, support for those came in, I think, version three uh, and we're on five now. So we can protect physical windows, um, physical Linux. Uh, all the main the main distributions, um, physical Solaris, physical AIX, um, with HPUX coming very shortly. Brilliant, thanks. I know that that's one of the questions I think we hear quite a lot. I think there's probably a, a, a misconception that Rubrik's purely for VMs, but so that's um, that's that's great. Uh, next question. So, um, what capability do you have to help with GDPR, i.e., uh, right to be forgotten or searches for PII, so personal ident identifiable information? Um, so first of all, um, right to be forgotten. We've got a couple of different ways we can we can um, tackle that, and it's definitely too complicated to go in to in 30 seconds. But um, we can we can effectively we can manage the metadata and, and hide it, but still retain that copy of data set if you need to also keep it for um, you, you know kind of um, uh, what's the word compliance reasons. Um, but we also have a methodology, again, actually, uh, I think it's possibly on a GitHub, but we also have a methodology where we can um, we can effectively delete data sets out of the snapshot chain and then kind of reconstruct them um, un under the hood. So we do actually allow the ability to, to delete data sets as well um, if you don't need to just hide it. Um, that's a that's a whole webinar in itself though um, so uh, and the second question was around PII um, so yes we, we have a couple of different ways we can do that as well um, the initial answer we had was yeah we can live mount the data set and you can crunch that um, uh, to search for your PII um, but also we have that capability within Polaris um, it's way quicker leveraging the public cloud so so we're, we're again making use of the of, of the public cloud in that instance to search for Whatever kind of PII it is, uh, be it credit card numbers or social security or whatever, whatever that may be. Thank you. And so I think we've got time for one last question. Um, and I think this, I assume this is referring to, um, I guess, what you mentioned about APIs. So uh, for new installations, what would you recommend to integrate first? That is uh, a good question. Um, so I would want so. I guess we want it back. So let's say we're, we're going into a, a typical data center where it's maybe maybe VMware or, or I don't know Nutanix or whatever is your production production workloads. We will integrate natively as part of the platform into 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 that that infrastructure anyway. If you wanted to then start talking about I guess wider integrations, probably the most common ones we see uh, is ServiceNow to allow. Both ITSM and ITOM, so we can do offer reporting, we can offer self-service and all that kind of good stuff, uh, or vRealize. Um, I guess typically after we integrate into the platforms themselves, which is kind of core core function of the product, then it's more more a choice of how the customer then wants to manage those. Maybe it's the provisioning of VMs or provisioning of services. Um, so I guess the short answer is there's no no one way to answer that question. Typically we go from platform then to platform management and then maybe to things like config management with you know chef or puppet or whatever whatever that may be 
Amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I thought perhaps that wouldn't be an easy, an easy, an easy, quick answer. Um, in which case, so we are, we are bang on time. We're going to finish up uh, tight now. Thank you again for joining us, um, and we hope you will uh, will join us again next time. Thank you very much, Ed, for uh, uh, being an awesome uh, guest expert speaker. Cheers. Thanks very much.